you do untitled. Studying the Tao is like striking a flint for fire. Don't stop just when smoke arises. Wait for the golden sparks to appear. Only then do you come to the end and hit home. So we continue with poetry by uh, Buddhist monks. Today's poem is a contribution by the monk Judun. So uh, this is the first um, time we've encountered him. So let's give some of his biographical background as it appears in um, the Biographical Dictionary of Tang Dynasty Literati in an entry that was written by Jing Hua Jia and Chun Li Yu. So Yu Dun is a late Tang monk poet. He um, lived from 835 to 923. So he survived the, the fall of the dynasty and he was from Jiangxi, that is the southern part of the Jiangsu River, so a southerner. And he spent most of his life there, becoming a, a famous monk and being granted different titles at the fall of the dynasty, including one by which he is frequently known, uh, Zheng Kong Da Shi, Master of Realizing Emptiness. And, uh, well, he was mainly a monk, but he wrote poetry. His poetry would have been gathas, that is, uh, in, what in Chinese is called Ji Song, Buddhist poetic verses, which are generally not considered standard poetry. And uh, during his lifetime, his poetry circulated a lot. Um, there was a collection of those poems uh, that was prefaced by Qi Yi. Qi Yi, we haven't talked about him yet, but along with um, Guangxu, he is probably the most important late Tang um, uh, monk poet. They're the two greatest figures in the late Tang are Qi Yi and Guangxu. Now this collection was lost, and interestingly, Yu Dun has no poem of his included in the Chuang Tangxi, which is like a gargantuan, many-volumed collection of most of the surviving Tang poetry. Uh, his, he has about 96 gathas, but they're preserved in a supplementary compilation of the Chuang Tangxi, the Chuang Tangxi Bubiang. Okay, so the usual issue that arises with... Um, with um, monk poets, is even stronger with Judun because, you know, his poetry is strictly Gatha, so they're, they're Buddhist poems on Buddhist subject matter, probably with a didactic, with a pedagogic intent. And um, they, they, they probably use, uh, like Han Shan's poems, at least some aspects of vernacular language and, you know, describe daily life occurrences, which might not be the typical subject matter of a scholar official poem and might use un weird, unusual metaphors, at least from the point of view of, of, of the tradition, uh, to elaborate Chan Buddhist ideas. And the poem we've read is probably an example of this. You know, it's a pretty straightforward poem. It doesn't, it's short. Mm, it doesn't have any complex um, allegories or, or, or references to um, classical works. It's strictly Buddhist. Like, like from the first line, it's talking about the Tao. Remember, Tao means enlightenment. So um, Tao is used by all the major philosophical and religious schools in China with these different meanings. Yeah? Like, for, like Confucian Tao is not the same as Taoist Tao, where the word is the most common, or Buddhist Tao, which is you know what we typically would call enlightenment. So, so the poem is, you know, it's just, it feels Zen Koan-esque, <laughs> which makes sense because Yudun was a Chan monk. But, you know, it feels like, like a little bit of a koan, but not as cryptic or, or mind-bending as koans tend to be. But, you know, it's a yeah, straightforward metaphor on, on how achieving illumination is like hitting a rock until the fire really, really comes out. And as it's pretty straightforward, I, I wouldn't... Uh, talk of sub-themes or of any other complicated aspect. It is a nice, a curious metaphor, which you probably would not encounter in a more traditional score official poem, this idea of hitting a piece of flint until you get the fire and not stopping at the sparks. That's a poem built on one comparison. And as I said, short poem, uh, these are four lines, and they are pentasyllabic lines. One, two, three, four, five, yeah. So this would be like a typical quatrain, uh, a pentasyllabic quatrain, which is the shortest of the canonical forms, although I don't think it is a, 
a pentasyllabic quatrain. It doesn't seem parallelistic, at least in the translation. Um, what else to say? Well, not much. Uh, let's just take a look at the poem, couplet by couplet. Studying the Tao is like striking a flint for fire. Don't stop just when smoke arises. So, you know, uh, 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 achieving enlightenment is a key um, Buddhist principle. For the Chan sect, the uh, uh, Chan sect generally favors like non-academic, a priori, because, you know, this always becomes much more complicated. But the typical Chan stance is not trying to achieve enlightenment through academic reading of sutras and in conventional Buddhist uh, practices, but um, trying to find the key to illumination in everyday life and in everyday um, actions. Yeah, it's, it's like, like our very Chan ideas that we are already living in Nirvana, but just we, 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 we do not perceive it. Um, so, so quotidian everyday actions can lead to illumination. So, so uh, there's also an emphasis on practice. Uh, the, the key idea at the beginning of the Chan sect was meditation, which is what Chan actually means. It's a translation of the Sanskrit Dhyana, which means you know sitting meditation. And this in the beginning was the technique that the Chan Buddhist sect employed, which is basically just sitting in meditation to try to achieve, um, achieve uh, enlightenment. And in, in many aspects, this was quite an iconoclastic uh, school uh, when compared or when contrasted with other Buddhist sects. So, yeah, so the idea here is, you know, the metaphor is pretty straightforward. You want to achieve illumination, you have to work hard for it. And don't just stop when you start seeing the first fruits. Like when you're hitting a flint, when the first sparks arise, or, or rather, when the smoke starts to arise, is not yet the time to stop. That's not true fire. So I imagine this could be very pedagogically illustrated. As you know, when you get the first benefits of, of meditation or of, of, of studying Buddhism, that's not illumination. You still have to go further along the road. That's what the second couplet develops. Wait for the golden sparks to appear. Only then do you come to the end and hit home. Home. The original home is uh, the Buddha nature. Well, also, not exclusively Chan, but there's this concept that all humans, this is a Mahayana concept, or at least of some Mahayana sects, uh, this idea that we all have an innate Buddha nature that is present in all of us. We all can and will become Buddhas after countless aeons uh, of, of, of time mm, develop. So you're just going home. Keep striking until the sparks appear. Like golden sparks clearly are, you know, a symbol for this fire is clearly enlightenment. But you have these images of the true fire and of going back home that uh, conclude the poem. So as I said, that's an interesting piece. Uh, it's very simple. It's just a development of one image, but I think it does that satisfactorily. In fact, uh, the, the, the writers of the century insist that uh, Judun's Gathers do present a certain degree of literary achievement, and I think this, this short poem probably testifies to that.